Good morning, friends, and welcome to the fifth episode of Downloads, Journey into Web3. In case you missed our last episode, uh, we talked about the three components of crypto success and about progressive decentralization. Today's subject is going to revolve around treasury diversification, why it matters, the rationale, advantages, disadvantages, who is doing it right, and dive a little bit into, into meta governance. So if you go on and take a look at some statistics on DeepDAO, for example, uh, we can see that DAO treasuries are worth billions as we speak, somewhere around 10 billion, actually. This sum increased significantly since we made those trades uh, back in January. And uh, this is especially important to consider because the markets have been extremely volatile. Um, if I'm not mistaken, in February, in February, it was the treasuries amounted to around eight to nine billion. So this sum is volatile because most of this value is occurred in the DAO's native token. So from the start, we can spot the need for a change here. There must be some better ways to manage a DAO treasury, right? Um, a DAO has many goals, but one of them is to maximize long-term token holder value. That can become problematic if uh, the organization decides to rely solely on its native treasury for support. Um, what do you think, Matei? Is this an important subject to have? Is uh, treasury diversification uh, a thing that all DAOs should consider? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's any sort of doubt around this. And that is because most treasuries, well, actually all of them, uh, are kickstarted from their governance tokens, tokenomics. And usually about, well, tens of percentages are directly injected into the um, treasury, whether vested or not. But this uh, leads to the main risk, and that is having your treasury's value fall the exact same per percentage as your governance token. So, for example, if it slides uh, by 50%, uh, then your treasury's value will also slide by 50%, and that's obviously an issue. And for this reason, we need treasury di diversification, and that is having multiple tokens, uh, fungible or not, in your treasury besides your own. And just like in traditional finance markets, um, uh, you need to have an efficient portfolio. So talking about Sharpie ratio, that's uh, the risk you're willing to take versus the uh, re return you're expecting. Uh, and there's a nonlinear correlation because adding more risk won't uh, always equal equally, uh, yeah, won't always uh, return as much. And so it's all about risk tolerance in DAOs. Uh, you can be more conservative, and opt for safer options. And we'll talk about these later, such as holding stable coins and maybe earning some yield on them. Or you can, uh, on the other hand, you can have a more aggressive approach and opt to get involved with, I don't know, maybe futures trading or leverage yield farming and whatnot. And I really enjoyed this article from uh, by Shreyas, uh, who's from Lama community. Uh, they help DAOs with treasury management, and recently they've drafted an amazing uh, report on Aves, e uh, Ethereum, and Polygon markets. It's simply amazing. And coming back to your question, Alex, um, uh, this article is relevant because Shreyas fo follows a list of uh, principles when it comes to DAO treasuries. And the list is as following. Uh, infinite time horizon. So think about your DAO treasury as continuously working as a perpetuity. It, you shouldn't think about it, uh, oh, well, my treasury will deplete in five years or, or ten. You shouldn't think about that. Then uh, you should consider inflows exceeding outflows because if your outflows exceed your inflows, uh, the treasury will eventually run out. And lastly, uh, diversifying your asset allocation. And all of these are vital because you can start a DAO and, as I previously said, um, operate it without thinking about it working in perpetuity. And also your members will, will think the same. And Alex, how exactly can we uh, manage a DAO's treasury? And what are our options when it comes to that? Yeah, so as DeFi continues to evolve, diversification practices are going to change as well. But for now, there are only a few ways that DAO can diversify its treasury without facing major risk or controversy. Um, one of the options is holding stable coins, as you said. 
um, because accounting for native token volatility can be troublesome. And um, you have to take into consideration that uh, contributors like having the option to choose to be remunerated partially in stable coins along with, let's say, vested native tokens. Um, stable coins can also be used to generate yield in DeFi, um, thus creating additional streams of income that can help uh, mitigate the inflation that comes with holding stables because they are still pegged to the dollar. We have to keep in mind the disadvantages of doing this. Um, another way is by forming strategic partnerships with long-term investors by exchanging, let's say, native tokens for stable coins. Um, and this can help ensure that the native tokens of the DAOs are held by long-term investors. Um, another simpler but riskier approach to this is borrowing um, against the native token. It is true that borrowing does not fully derive the treasury because of the liquidation risk that comes with it, but is, it is a simpler alternative compared to a strategic, strategic partnership, for example. Um, what would you add to this? As you said, it all comes down to risk tolerance. Yeah, that's right. And uh, exactly because of this, I would first start with the need for a committee or group of people that oversee all of these operations. So first of all, the treasury diversification process in what type of tokens uh, should you diversify? But they will also take into account inflows and outflows so they can draw quarterly, monthly, yearly reports and they can uh, renew their projected returns. They also think about what the operating expenses of the DAO are and formulate strategies how to make the most out of it. For example, the stable coins you were talking about and the yield uh, DAO can, could earn on them uh, could be used to cover these operating expenses. So, for example, uh, covering the salaries of your core contributors. Uh, as you said, they might opt to get at least a part of their salary in stable coins and the other one in governance tokens, vested or not. And uh, now, stable coins are obviously the safest, and they are usually used for liquidity needs. So, if there is a market downturn, you could uh, use the stable coins to buy some new assets or simply continue, make sure you can continue your uh, operations just as you did before. However, um, how can you get these stable coins? Well, a DAO can sell their native token, but using a decentralized exchange causes high slippage problems. So that's probably not a good issue, uh, not a good idea unless you're going to sell just a bit. But even so, I mean, even if I, I read this in an article somewhere, I think it was from Bankless, even if uh, Uniswap were to uh, sell 1% of their treasury uh, into stables, they would cause such a high slippage that it, it makes absolutely no sense to do that. So uh, what can you do? Uh, they can be sold over the counter uh, to institutional or uh, institutional investors or just community members. Uh, as you said, you can also earn yield on them. And uh, now I'd like to move to another method uh, that is simply holding blue chip tokens, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. They give exposure to the overall market. So any type of market movements, you will benefit or you know lose, uh, miss out because of them. But uh, the thing uh, they're good at, as uh, you also mentioned, is borrowing against uh, these assets. So lots of DAO tokens aren't available to be borrowed against, right? I mean, for example, ours. As of today, it's not available on any market. And so you would need these uh, blue chip tokens to cover such a over collateralized debt. Another one, another method would be investing in index tokens, such as ILSI or DPI. Uh, they, or NOX. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, why not? And because they simply uh, they simplify the asset alloc allocation. So instead of having your committee research, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 uh, different tokens, you could trust someone that built an index or simply build it yourself and invest, it, invest in it right away. And there are way, way less uh, hours spent on working and maintaining it. Now, you could also invest in early stage projects, uh, seed rounds, series A, series B, and so on. 
and uh, token swaps with other DAOs, as you said. Uh, they, I mean, these type of token swaps also mitigate the risk of uh, selling right after you've made a profit. So because the tokens are swapped, uh, both of the DAOs have an incentive to make the other DAO grow, to make their processes better. So their uh, part, their fair share of the deal uh, gets bigger. And uh, I was wondering, I'd like to ask you about this, Alex. Uh, how, how do you see this, this type of token swaps? And how is this different? What type of advantages does it bring compared to the traditional finance? Well, this is actually interesting because it incentivizes the DAOs to cooperate and do well. <clears throat> Sorry. And because everyone has some ownership in the other DAO story, let's say, for example, um, you want that DAO to win. And this has so much disadvantages that we are going to discuss when we are going to dive into meta governance. But uh, regarding, I, I'm going to go a little bit back on the stablecoin aspect because there it sounds good but there is also there are also some disadvantages like for example uh, what if the fed or whatever goes after the stable coins and just creates a crackdown on those then the stable coins are not actually a good alternative So yeah, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, definitely. You could eventually think about diversifying into different stable coins, right? So you are less, uh, you are less exposed to the type of risk you just mentioned. I mean, you could own USD, USDT, USDC, and so on. Yeah, yeah, because the main the main villain in the room is Tether, let's say. But uh, if the 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 government goes on and develops a cbdc it's clear that uh, any type of stable coin will, will not be allowed of course this is a black swan uh, scenario but it's still something that should be worth considering now uh, going that going back to meta governance um as part of any treasury diversification strategy a protocol can also extend its voting power through meta governance which is the ability to influence another protocol through ownership of their token exactly as uh, as you said so let's say for example you have some ave in your treasury in your DAO's treasury as part of your diversification strategy you can actually go on their governance site and start a, a proposal and delegate those tokens to, let's say, a voting committee and have them vote on that proposal. This can give you all sorts of advantages because maybe you have a product that uh, you want to list there and there is this is one of the ways in which you can do it. Um, there are a bunch of use cases for meta governance and we, ha and we see projects like uh, rabbit hole and index scoop taking the lead here. Um, there is also a workaround for the lack of interest that token holders um, are showing when it comes to voting, for example, um, because most token holders are not interested in that. And maybe DAOs will have to rely on DAO to DAO partnerships um, and exchange tokens in order to achieve that minimum threshold. Um, you vote so a situation will look like this you vote in my DAO and help me take this proposal further i help you do the same this creates a strong bond between DAOs and it can create a thriving ecosystem but it's also dangerous because if trust is removed from the equation um, and someone has ill intention it can lead to a cascade of things so Absolutely, I, and uh, uh, I, I was thinking, especially in index groups case, because they do indexes, right? Uh, the meta governance idea is the following: uh, you hold the index, and that's uh, let's say ten different tokens, yeah. And some of those tokens might have governance rights to them, as you just said. But since you hold the index, so you just indirectly hold the, the other tokens, not directly, how are you going to vote if you're interested to do so? Well, through exactly through this, through meta governance. And this uh, also exists in traditional finance, where it's called investment stewardship, where big fund managers vote on board members, compensation matters, and so on. But uh, what IndexCoop does is they list the proposals 
uh, related to their index on their Snapshot page. And this leads to people's votes, people who own uh, the said index. Uh, their votes don't, don't go to waste. And by this, they help meet protocol quorums because there's a huge issue in DAO voting with uh, protocols and projects that simply do not meet the quorum criteria or threshold. And so by using these tokens, you can use uh, these votes that would other, otherwise go to waste and help implement uh, whatever proposals going on. But what I've seen is that uh, in the article that I read anyway, um, they had a 5% quorum on their um, index. Uh, I'm talking about index group. And I was thinking, Alex, what do you think about this? What do you think about this exact percentage of 5%? Well, I I saw I saw someone I sorry for forgetting the name I'm I'm really bad at this but some I, I saw in an article someone mentioning the fact that the the percentage was somewhere around two percent that's where that's where the average that's the average voting um, implication and I think it's low for a reason because people are not interested in participating actively in that and it's fair because they are not actually used to it um, and until we build a community that is educated enough in order to make those decisions and get involved in that i think um, it's a decent number it's 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 okay for for uh, for a start all right i mean what i would have said is that the five percent seems, I mean, yeah, compared to the usual two or three percent uh, threshold that gets met, uh, it seems kind of low. Uh, I mean, overall, because imagine this: uh, if only five percent of the people who own the the uh, index they vote, they will eventually use all of the other ninety-five votes for something they want and. Mind you, this is not, I mean, the 5% is just a threshold. So you would need 2.5% plus one to meet the, you know, for the proposal to go through with a yes or a no. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of people giving away their votes to a very small number of people. And uh, my point is, these, all of these investors could definitely be retail investors. So not whales, not, I don't know, medium-sized wallets. They could all be small wallets. But what's stopping a few funds from buying very much of the index so they could meet the 5% threshold and they can just deal with themselves? Yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's probably going to be a reality in some cases. And um, there is nothing you can do about it when you choose a decentralized system and when you choose um, this path you have to take in consideration those risks. And yeah, it's low, but we are still early and um, we need we need to educate more people um, about this. And that is why it's a, a mission that is worth pursuing, as we said in the last episode, the decentralization part. And um, I also liked, liked the, the article you wrote in our Romanian newsletter about protocol politicians, because probably they are going to be the ones who are going to cast those votes and have this delegated power um, centered on them. This makes me think uh, about a parallel because DAOs are, are, in this regard, are starting to look a little bit uh, like nation states rather than companies, for example. So we're seeing this mix between, uh, we see DAOs become this mix between uh, those structures that, uh, that we used to have. And this um, is complicating things a lot. Yeah, definitely. And I also think that we kind of went past the stage where people just said that, oh, yeah, DAOs are just LLC, but on the blockchain. And they they kind of do like nation states, especially when their um, progress in decentralization and their progressive decentralization goes further. So we're uh, not seeing as many core teams that do everything by themselves, but actually people from the community you know, sp stepping up and start uh, initiatives on their own, being leaders and so forth. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious and I'm so glad to be part of this movement and see how things evolve in the space. So I think, what do you think about, have you seen the, the way meta governance is done, for example, in rabbit hole? What do you, what do you think about, uh, about the strategy, for example? So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, rabbit holes, meta governance system goes through, uh, delegate, I mean, they get, uh, the, some votes get delegated to their, uh, meta governance pod, right? Uh, right, because they, they don't have a native token. That, yeah. that's, that's the first thing that sh we should clarify. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like that idea of a pod, first of all. So basically, a pod is like a committee, like a work group, but it's simply called a pod. And um, uh, that, this pod they created is made out of people who obviously applied and so have some background in proposal voting and also at least uh, one specialist for every protocol they vote on. And this is what I found interesting because they also had open submissions for this. And ca can you imagine how you're, you're like a, a truly delegated politician, right? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I, I see rabbit hole becoming this place where people educate and then just go and build on other projects. Like I, I, I see rabbit hole becoming um, a gateway when it comes to when it comes to that so yeah it's definitely interesting definitely and uh, i wanted to sorry for going back uh, i just forgot to mention this uh, when talking about it's kind of related to governance too so don't worry about it uh when coming to um treasury diversification you could also do it with blue chip nfts and the reason i came back to this is because i will ask you a question at the end of it uh blue chip nfts yeah you could consider uh, the Borrowed Day Piaf Club and uh, CryptoPunks, uh, Blue Chips, I would say. And maybe several other, there are definitely some discussions going on in the space, but these two have definitely, definitely made themselves worthy of being called Blue Chips. And this is, I think, uh, a very, a very interesting way to diversify because of two things. First of all, you could use it for the DAO's brand image. You could, I mean, nothing stopping you putting your board ape on your Twitter account or something. And the second one, you managed to diversify away from the crypto market. Because, I mean, yes, indeed, people who are buying NFTs are mostly into crypto. But I think it's the only blockchain related market that is sort of not so not so related to how the crypto market does, right? Because, okay, yes, uh, number go up, number go down, but uh, even though you pay in Ethereum, it could, your collection might very well appreciate while the crypto market is going down because of whatever is going on. I mean, let's say intellectual property, right? And simply having this exposure to another segment of the blockchain universe, I think is uh, very, very unique, you know, for any type of... Uh, any type of treasury and they can also be deposited into DeFi applications such as NFTX and you, you can split, uh, you can deposit your uh, crypto punk, let's say, you can deposit it somewhere, split it into uh, ERC20 tokens and uh, use the tokens to provide liquidity for people that basically want to DCA into the NFT. So instead of having to save up, I don't know, you know, tens, literally tens of Ethereum, you could slowly DCA your way up to a crypto punk. And when you have the, you have enough tokens, you simply redeem the token that's blocked in the protocol. Yeah, why not? It sounds wild and it's definitely something that has not been tested you know, when it comes to the treasury diversification, but why not? I mean, if it makes sense and probably it's going to be a small percentage of that, but why not? Because we see we see a lot of value of value creating around uh, created around those NFTs, and um, it's going to be a bold move. But who is going to do first? We probably set an example. For... Definitely, I think so too. And one thing I just thought about: imagine there was, I mean, there probably are, but uh, just for the sake of this exercise. Um, imagine you were a DAO who held a board ape before the ape token airdrop, right? So you had your treasury diversified. 
you received tokens that you know are worth some amount in dollars mm -hmm. but what you were also given were and this comes back to our governance slash meta governance stuff you were also given governance power in this new thing that you already believed in and now you have the power to you know say what you will exactly exactly this is why meta governance is such an interesting subject and uh, how the um, the ecosystem will connect will is just amazing in my opinion um shout out by the way shout out to our friends at cryptomatics who started their uh, their journey with a with a um, crypto punk they, it, it, i just uh, remember that when you were talking about it uh, interesting yeah so yeah i mean yeah, i also thought about them while while talking about it so yeah yeah cool so i think this is pretty much a wrap up for this episode uh we thank you for much so much for watching and uh, we hope to see you in the next one see you